this. Let me let me make a short video. And um, I love it. I absolutely love it. If 10 people watch my videos, if 10,000 people watches my video, um, I'm happy, you know. So uh, thank you guys for joining. Um, my line sister is going to co-host with me. So you'll be sitting with Scale and Allison. Um, I'm going to let her get into, like, everything that she does, but, like, I'll do the heart part of it. Like, Allison is a mentor to me. Like, I look up to her so much. Um, you know, when I'm, when I'm bragging on her, I call her Dr. Dr. Allison Matthews. <laughs> oh, come on. But, like, she just, like, like, she just did with Brittany, first time ever seeing her face, and was just like, well, this is what you need to do, and that's what she does. She always speaks life into us, always um speaks positivity into us our line sisters but i'm sure any and everybody that she meets right and so um like i said i'm gonna let her get oh and she's a travel nor like i, I want to be able to go to nicaragua and prague and, <laughs> and everything so yeah so now the logistics, logistics of you allison <laughs> i i Thank you all for joining today. I'm so excited about this. I'm so proud of just Gail for just taking the initiative and just starting something. I just love it when, when I see people just, you know, just start things. So she, she you know, and she's been doing so much in the community. Uh, she's our, our budding activist, our deuce on the line, who is, who is just like leading the way. And so I'm very proud of you for that. Uh, so Thanks. my name is Allison Matthews. I, I do have a PhD in sociology and um, I work now at uh, Wake Forest University. I'm an associate director of a program called Integrating Special Populations in the Maya Angelou Center for Health Equity. Um, so I do a lot of different work around health equity, trying to, or I do like community organizing, marketing, social marketing, working with clinical trials and clinical researchers. So right now I'm doing a lot around the COVID vaccine um, work and COVID testing and trying to get access, increased access to our communities. Um, I have traveled around the world. I think I've traveled to like 20 countries. So if y'all have any questions about that. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> also run I was kidding. <laughs> um, oh. have, you, have you been to Ghana? I have not. I would love to go to Ghana. I've been to South Africa and I've been to Morocco. I've been to South nice. Africa three times um, in Morocco. And yeah. Beautiful. So, yeah. and oh, and I run a company that does consulting work um, with different research institutions like Johns Hopkins and George Washington and UNC and Duke um, doing the same work, health equity work. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, so the very first book discussion is on the year of yes by Shonda Rhimes. I picked this book because first of all, it's one of my favorite books. It's, I don't want to say a Bible, but definitely a, bru a blueprint for um, for life, for womanhood, for sisterhood, for um, working togetherhood. <laughs> Just made that up. And so um, if you have not read the book, I'm going to kind of read a little excerpt and then like kind of, you know, go more into detail about the book. OK, so you never say yes to anything. Six startling words. That's the beginning. That's the origin of it all. My sister Dolores said six startling words and changed everything. She said six words. And now as I write this, I have become a different person. So, you know, throughout the rest of the book, um, Shauna tells how you know, when she first got into the industry, she said no to everything. So all the lavish parties, all speaking engagements, all, you know, womanhood, sisterhood events like this one, like she said, no, she felt like she was a behind the scenes person. But, you know, those are the excuses we use, right, to like run away from ourselves. Like if we have to go in front of people, we have a mirror and we have to, you know, then be faced with 
all of our own insecurities. So instead she hid behind them. So when she had this conversation with her sister, she realized that that was the catalyst of like, I need to get myself together. I need to work on myself. I need to do things for myself. Right. So, um, and of course, you know, throughout the book, she became, like she said, a different person. She, you know, bud into this beautiful woman, into this more confident woman, into this more assertive woman, all things that we all need to do. And so that's why I said, like, please come because you don't, you don't have to read the book to like understand this theme. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to read the book to understand any of these things, right? So um, I'm going to go into the first theme. So uh, Shonda talks about um, receiving compliments. And so I did not know that I had a problem with receiving compliments until I read this book. So um, here's an excerpt. Someone says, I love your show. You know what I say back? I say, oh my God, I'm just so lucky. Just, you know, really fortunate. It's not me. It's everyone who works with me. But why am I running around saying it's not me? Because it is me. It's me and it's them. It's us. And what, it, and what the hell is up with the I'm just so lucky line anyway? Thank you, smile, shut up. <laughs> and what happens is when I give myself permission to just hear the compliments and not apologize for the compliments or brush them off or negate them, I start to appreciate the compliments. The compliments mean something to me. More important, the fact that someone paused to take the time to give me a compliment means something to me. No one is obligated to compliment you. They do it out of kindness. They do it because they want to. They do it because they believe the compliment they are offering. So when you negate someone's compliment, you're telling them that they're wrong. You're telling them that they wasted their time. You're questioning their taste and judgment. You're insulting them. So Allison, you know, I know you've read this book and, you know, even me reading out loud might have jogged something. So like, what, what do you think on the subject of compliments and, and receiving compliments more? Ooh, so I, I, I really have enjoyed, I enjoyed the book. I read it, um, you know, I tend to read books like right before I go to sleep, just as a way to help me wind down for the day. And it, you know, just reading words from Shonda Rhimes, like, you know, that's always super motivating for me. Um, I think I was, I did have a lot of that, you know, issue of like accepting compliments, but I think um, I've, I have started to learn the art of just saying, thank you, thank you. Like, I appreciate that because, um, you know, and really just accepting it. And, and, accepting that yes the the person is they're not they're doing it to just like lift you up right and so like you always lift up your friends right you always lift up other people why can't you accept it for yourself and i i do think that that really has helped me even with my self confidence like being out and like um and and in negotiating in business and, and you know and and like moving up in my career and things like that especially because it really does sting when people criticize you right and so it's it's just it's i think it's important for us to take in the positivity that people give you because there will be times when i have when i have definitely gotten very some very strong criticism from people and so just trying to take advantage of the positivity when it comes my way i think is really important does anybody else have anything to add oh leah you sure you don't want to say that out loud <laughs> Mm. So, so I work at the School of Science and Math, which it's not where I saw myself 
um, when I went to school, but it's where I am. So I'm grateful to have a job. But um, I have a coworker who is like bubbly almost 24 seven. And she always gives like, she always says like, I'm so amazing or I'm incredible. And I'm like, girl, <laughs> I'm really not doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say that. And I always try to reflect it back on her and how I feel like she's a great community coordinator. Um, but hearing this is definitely like, dang, maybe I am doing something, but I just don't see it. The way that other people see it. Um, so now it's definitely something I have to be more mindful of and just like Shonda said, shut up and smile and say thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, smile. Thank you. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody else have anything to add? Yeah. My point was gonna be just like Leah's. I just feel like I get a lot of compliments. Like even just Kel when I did that event and you reposted me and I was just like, I mean, I just do the things that I feel should be done and I do those without expecting like an award or thinking that I'm doing anything better than anyone or like if someone says like your outfit is nice i'm like oh this thing like i downplay compliments because one i don't feel like i do anything that's superbly different and then i also downplay them because i don't want the person giving them to me to feel like i think i'm better than them or i'm doing better than them or i'm i look better than them, or whatever the case may be so i always everything i say has like an asterisk behind it like oh I love your house I'm like oh this small town home mm -hmm. well, yeah something that I also heard was if you if you negate their compliment it's also making them feel bad and that actually kind of changed my perception about that because I don't ever want to make people feel bad you know and and so that was like oh I really you know, it is a nice thing to accept their compliment. It could be seen as rude if I don't accept their compliment. And I think that did kind of, and also men have no problems accepting compliments. So why are we like, <laughs> you know, we should accept compliments. It's okay. I've actually met a guy who does have a difficult time and it really shocked me because I'm like, just say thank you. <laughs> like it would be something simple. And he'd be like, nah. And I'm like, just say thank you. <laughs> yeah. So that's probably what people are thinking when we do it. Like, just say thank you. I think I've done the same thing. Like, I like um, I work really hard on, like, my fitness and my eating and my everything. And so then people will say something like, you got nice arms. And I'm like, oh, it's probably because you haven't seen me in a while. Knowing I've been in the gym probably six times. Before. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, like, I, like everybody's saying, it's like, just accept the compliment just like you know it's like having pride in what you do like i do have pride in going to the gym or, or in it and all the other things that i do and so it's like lately people have been like they gave our compliments and then i'm like and I, and I pause for a minute and i'm like thank you i'm like you are actually right about that and then like leave it at that and so i don't know i think it helps me because it's like when you're because when you're negating it you're thinking negatively right so if you're like if somebody says you look nice today and you're like anything you put in this negative inside of your head right and so then it brings your mood down so i feel like you know accepting the compliment being happy about the compliment that like gives you a mood boost that makes sense and i have a, I, I have a comment like how often do we internalize compliments because i feel like we highlight and we overthink about the negative things, but when it comes to compliments, we negate them or we don't, you know what I'm saying? I don't think we really take them in. I think it's, it's a difference between something positive and something negative. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I think that's a great point. And, and, and when you see a lot of times, we talk about affirmations, right? Like where you, re you have to repeat to yourself even that, positive things and giving yourself compliments um and and you know i think it is important to also just when someone says something you have to like be mindful about and stop yourself from dismissing it and being like mm -hmm. it's, it's, sometimes it's really hard you're like thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, thank oh. you 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys are doing it, and I love it. Like, you know, if you have something that you want to say, like, definitely drop it in the chat, too. Or if you don't feel like saying it out loud, you're like, oh, I don't want to overtalk somebody, like, definitely drop, drop it in the chat, because, um, like, a lot of you guys are doing that, too. Um, so, we have a prize. You get a prize. You get a prize. You get a prize. <laughs> <laughs> um, Allison, do you want to tell them what the first prize is? Okay, so part of the the idea behind this, like sitting with Skell, and to, today it's me. Uh, well, ho hopefully she'll be hosting with other people as well. Um, is to you know just celebrate and thank you all for joining and contributing to the conversation. Um, so I have donated thirty minutes of my time to talk to. Um, I don't remember who, how we're selecting who's going to be getting that, but um, I'll be donate, donating 30 minutes of my time to con, con, do a consultation with people about their business or any kind of ideas that they have um, just to help them grow and get them connected to people because I have a very vast network that I like to share with people. Mm. While we're doing this, I'm going to write down some names and I'm going to draw them out of a hat. <laughs> So that will so we'll figure out who the, the name is at the end. Um, so uh, we will go on to the next topic. So like um, over the past year, you know, uh, it's been magnified. And I'm guessing, you know, a lot of things have happened because of COVID. But we've been talking about um, like toxic relationships, uh, toxic friendships and self-care, right? And so um, I wanted to explore the theme of boundaries because we can identify like the negative stuff, but it's like, okay, now let's let's identify the solution. Here's an excerpt. <laughs> then something happens with one of the people on the ride or die list. Let's call her Pam. Pam is a friend who I would describe as a genuinely wonderful person, strong and really funny, witty, kind, laid back, loyal, adventurous. But as I leap into this challenging year of yes and take tentative steps towards being happy, Pam becomes a wall of ice. So I do what I always do when I want to talk something out. When I want to be told the unvarnished truth, I call on my inner circle, the rider dies. We gather for dinner. I tell them everything. They're quiet and listening. What? I'm freaked out. The rider dies never hold back. Tell me. Finally, one of them takes the plunge. We've been wondering when this would happen when you will finally notice how Pam was treating you. What are they talking about? They tell me that they have always been suspicious of Pam. To their eyes, Pam is not happy. I'm happy. She's suffering because I've changed and they've noticed. I am no longer willing to be a doormat, so Pam has no function. They very gently tell me, Pam has never been the person I thought she was. So, Allison, um, please enlighten us. Have you and your friendships and your business relationships came across a Pam? So many times. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess the one that I can think of um, immediately, I have a friend who I've been best friends with for a long time. Like, I would like long time. And we've, we've tried to do some business ventures together. Um, and when I, when I started my company, so the business ventures we tried were like, um, these arts events and I would do my photography exhibits and then he would, he would show his artwork. And then there was this, like, we got in these arguments where he'd be like, well, um, you're getting all this, all these sales and you're not telling people to go over to me. And I'm like, 
okay. <laughs> you know, I was like, but you're making sales too. Like, I thought this was a mutually beneficial thing. And then it became, well, I created the event and I was trying to help you out. And, and now you're getting all this attention from it. And I'm just like, why is this, you know, so then I kind of dismissed that and I was like, but we're friends. We're fine. It's fine. I'll just let it go. Right. And then I started a, a business with some other friends who he was also friends with and that I'm still in, in relationship with them. I'm still in a business um, venture with them. We started this tech business and it's like um, digital links. It helps people get access to free medication if they can't afford the medication. And he just was like making comments like, you know, they're not going to um, do the work. They're not going to be consistent. And I just, you know, we'll see how it works out. You know, just kind of making these like negative comments. And then, you know, it was hard to like kind of walk away from that. But I had to eventually I had to just like kind of distance myself because I felt like anytime I was trying to support him or, you know, talk about maybe some struggles that I have or, you know, move forward and grow in my company and in my work. He would always have some negative comment or he would start an argument with someone that I had connected him to, like to try to help him. And I'm just like, you know what, this is toxic. This is not, this is, you know, there's something that you're, you're doing some self-sabotaging and it's also adding toxicity to my life. And so um, I don't know if we necessarily had a confrontation conversation, but it was definitely a, you know, kind of just not reaching out as often and not really, you know, putting in the energy to keep the friendship going. Anybody else got an experience? Oof. It's hard because it feels like you're breaking up with someone, even though you're friends with them. <laughs> I think I feel like I've dated somebody like that. Like I've had like um, I feel like I've like, you know, started to shine. Right. Started to like, you know, come into myself and stuff like that. And then it's like well, what about me type of thing? Like, instead of like, oh, you know, that's my girl. She got it. She gonna come home to me later. It's like, well, why you gotta do this? And why you gotta wear heels when you go? And why you gotta always have on makeup? Like, stuff like that. Like, one of those people, like, you should be the main person that's like, go on, like, do that. Put on more, uh-uh, why your, your lash looking, you know what I'm saying? So it, um, it does hurt to feel like, you know, you have this thing going on, you have this big plans and, you know, somebody that you feel like is supposed to be in your corner is the person that's least likely to be in your corner. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have, <laughs> I had a uh, girlfriend that I was really close with in college and all through grad school. And um, I think it's hard when, you know, you seem to have been in each other's corner for so long. Sorry, my little tiny coworkers are, you know, having some fun in the background. <laughs> but I think it's hard when you kind of recognize that uh, this friendship or this relationship is not really you know, it's not meant to go the distance because I think when we become friends with people and when we build relationships with people, you know, we don't ever think about um, the fact that sometimes those relationships have to end. And I remember when I kind of recognized this about this, this particular um, friend of mine, I was just like, you know, all right, I think we're going to have to go our separate ways. And it's, it's not that you know, we still didn't want the best for each other. It's just that we were going in different ways. And I kind of recognized that before she did. And that's okay. And I was okay with it. She was very upset. And, you know, it, it, I have also seen some of my other girlfriends kind of come to that point right now. And I try to remind them that, you know, growth for everybody looks differently. And even Allison, you know, just listening to your story, it sounds like, you know, you were growing and your friend your Peter or Pam or whatever, you know, was not. And, and, and that's okay. And I think that, you know, it also takes a lot of internal well-being to, to recognize that and to know that, you know, some people are here for 
a lot of seasons and some people are only here for a couple of reasons. So, yeah. That's, that's hard for me. I want everybody to come with me everywhere. Like, I feel like if I'm elevating, if I'm doing something, like, come on, like, everybody. And I feel like sometimes I, like, drag people, like, no, we are doing this, you know? And that's, like, slowing down your, your growth and, like, your progression. I, I used to be like that, but um, uh, another Peter that I had was, I was in a relationship with a Peter that, was very toxic and um i put in so much energy into that relationship and trying to like as i was growing he was same thing like why are you wearing makeup why are you wearing these clothes like became very controlling and you know i had to go through this process of learning how to let go of that and and to be my own person and then recognizing those, those become signs, they're patterns that you see uh, across a lot of people. Um, you know, the, you, don't, you don't need to, I think it's, it's one thing to want to help people and you can help them without necessarily um, sacrificing your boundaries and your, and your like self-care. And so, you know, at the point where it becomes uh, negative for you or you feel like you're drained in some way or that you are forcing you're doing more for them than they're doing for themselves then you're gonna have to like recognize okay this is not <laughs> this is not good for either one of us and and sometimes that like maybe the way to to help you do that is by saying I'm taking care of you by taking care of myself right now and you know, this is not good for either one of us. So I'm just going to stop. <laughs> What's some other good, like, boundary sentences or, like, how to, like, especially if you, you're you with somebody and there are no boundaries and you realize that and you're like, okay, now we got to start with some boundaries. Like, what are some good ways to, like, or phrases or things to start boundaries? Anybody? Well, I know, like, probably the best one is no. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, like as a sentence like I had to play this over and over in my mind like no is a sentence and so like and then you know variations of no is like you know I really wish I could help you right now but I'm not able or um can I get back to you um and then just letting people know like okay um using I statements like um like I wasn't comfortable with this or I, it hurt my feelings when this happened, you know, stuff like that. And so like, not like, like you suck and you did this to me, but it's like, I really didn't enjoy this. I really didn't like that. And usually when you, you know, I, it hurt my feelings, you know, when this, that usually like takes off the bite and the edge on people. And so they um, are more likely to, you know, listen to what you have to say. Yeah, and I think uh, for me, it took a long time for me, me to be able to verbalize those things, and especially because I was in a relationship for so long that where I was kind of taught not to speak up. Um, and so I started to write, I just wrote it out first. And like, I, I think I, because I could not verbalize, I just wrote it and wrote a letter to them or I wrote an email to them. And then eventually I was able to practice and embrace the, the kind of uncomfortable discomfort. Like when I, when I have to confront somebody, my heart beats really fast and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I get really nervous and I start to shake. But then my, one of my, my therapists was like, when you notice that in your body, you use that, use that as energy to push you forward rather than walking away from that confrontation. So that helped me too. And I think that oftentimes, like, we shy away from having those hard conversations. But I do, like, and especially for me recently, just showing up for myself. Like, like you said, those um, I feel like this or using no or, you know, just saying how we truly feel instead of being afraid, I think is really important um, when it comes to, like, showing up for yourself. So I agree. I like the idea of, like, um... Showing like you like uh Cynthia said, 
for yourself, like doing this for yourself. Like I, I'm, I call it a vulnerability knot. I get this knot in my chest when I have to speak with somebody and stuff like that. And then, you know, I had a um, conversation with my therapist about how like, I don't like disappointing people. Like, and so I will sacrifice my time, my sleep, mm -hmm. money, like just to make sure that somebody else is comfortable. And so like, she was just saying like, you gotta be, get comfortable, like knowing that you're gonna make somebody discomfort or give somebody discomfort or make somebody, you know, disappointed and stuff like that. And I feel like, you know, that helps because, you know, like kind of what Cynthia was saying is just like, you know, hey, you gotta, and Allison, you said this too, like you gotta, um, like if I'm okay, then you're going to be okay. But if I'm drained and everything, then it's going to eventually affect the relationship anyway. Yeah. That's good. And, and also acknowledging that if the person really cares about you, they want to hear the confrontational stuff too. They like your relationship can can withstand some negativity. Like you wouldn't you don't you don't ever worry about that when you talk to your sister or your brother and you tell them that they're getting on your nerves. <laughs> no, they're never gonna leave, right? They're always gonna love you no matter what. I, I fight with my sister all the time, but I know that she will never leave me, right? So like having that kind of not acknowledge or kind of knowing that if the person is worth it, they're going to take that and be comfortable. They're going to take that discomfort and they're going to sit with it and they're going to think about it and they're going to work on it because they care about you. And if they don't, then they're just not worth your time anyway. You get that good side. Okay, so you guys, I know you guys watch my videos. So on um, one of my videos, I uh, talked about how when I read my books, I write down notes, right? And so, um, and I use those, I go, I refer back to them all the time and I have ratty sheets of paper, probably just, to, <laughs> I write them down in ratty sheets of paper fold them up, put them in the books. And so I decided to make these note cards for you guys. And so I'm sending a couple to everybody. And so you can write on these from your books that I recommend to you guys to read. <laughs> and so um, definitely make sure that I get your address. Um, text me, DM me, you know, email me. Make sure I get your address so I can send you guys these note cards. And they um, can double as a uh, bookmark suit. So, and it says sit with scale. At the Thank top. you, Oprah. Right. <laughs> you can open it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, next, right? This is this is one that. Um, I feel like now get it, I'm getting into, okay? So, you know, with, with women, no matter, sometimes no matter how much education we get, no matter how much experience we have, we are told that we can only get so far, you know, in our careers. And so I want to discuss the theme of the glass ceiling. All right. 50 years ago, trying to get out of separate rooms. 30 years ago, trying to not serve breakfast or be groped by their bosses. 15 years ago, trying to make clear that they could run a department as well as the guy over there. All the women, white or black or brown, who woke up like this, who came before me in this town, think of them. Heads up, eyes on the target, running full, street, full speed, gravity be down, toward that thick layer of glass that is the ceiling. Running, full speed and crashing. Crashing into that ceiling and falling back. Crashing into it and falling back. Into it and falling back. Woman after woman. Each one running and each one crashing. And everyone falling. And I ran. And when I finally hit that ceiling, it just exploded into dust. Like that. My sisters who went before me had already handled it. Allison, what are your thoughts about, especially, uh, I think, 
you know, I'm sure you go through this, right? Because um, it's, I work in medicine, so I know how people are. I know how doctor, I know how men are, you know, look at you like, what are you talking about? Oh, you're, are you, you think you're speaking to me? And having to stand strong and say, no, you need to look at my patient right now. And so um, what are your experiences with being held back and um, the glass ceiling? Sometimes it comes from your own people, which is the sad part. Uh, you know, interestingly, so there's, I think there's multiple layers to it. So I, because I have a doctorate, because I have a PhD, um, I get a certain level of respect that I know that my black female colleagues who don't have PhDs, they don't get. Um, and so when, when I'm talking to medical doctors or, um, you know, the CEO of the hospital and those kinds of things, they give me a certain respect and they, um, that others don't get. But at the same time, because I'm a black woman, there's still definitely this, um, a lot of times they, they don't call me doctor. Um, so that's, it's, there's like little subtle things, right? Like they'll be like, oh, Allison, blah, blah, blah. Or they'll always introduce everyone else as doctor such and such, but then they just say, oh, Allison. And I'm like, no, Dr. Matthews is the correct term. <laughs> You know, that's the correct way to address me. Um, right. so that's, that's been one thing. And then um, with, unfortunately, I've had some very negative experiences with Black female uh, colleagues who, I don't know if it's, I think because they have been hazed in a way in academic culture and, and in medicine, um, they've been treated badly and they have um, experienced a lot of discrimination. And as mentors to me, they have inflicted that on me, um, which I think is really sad. And I've just, I've just been very conscious of not reproducing that for the people who I mentor and I work with. I'm trying to um, advocate for people, get open doors for them, make sure that they have the opportunities that will get them to the next level um, and not put them down. Like I had, I had a, a black female mentor who, um, you know, she would, she would write on my, on my paper. Like I have to write for a living. She would write on my papers. Like you really, like you don't know what you're talking about and you really should be further along than you are right now. And, this just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, it's just like, oh, like, so that was hard. Um, and, but I think it's also, there's a, it's important to find people. So I have had some white male mentors who actually have been um, really good at sponsoring me. And, and by sponsorship, I mean, by making sure that instead of like, they would get an invite to go speak somewhere, like at the National Institute of Health or at, in South Africa even. And instead of going themselves, they would say, oh, I don't need to go. I'm gonna send Allison instead. And so I think that that kind of um, leadership really matters. Um, and so being able to find people who can do that for you or who value that, and or doing it for other people, I think is really important. That's dope, that is dope. Anybody else? Anybody else got any glass ceiling stories? I think, um, I think black women, they try to put black women in a box, right? Like, like perfect example, this um, WAP uh, video and song. And oh, now these two women are set in black back uh, women for centuries and I can't believe this and I can't believe that where future can add you to his collection and go gold, you know? And so uh, we might not have like, I think we don't have the, you know, the job glass. I just feel like as women, like, um, and so somebody asked me, 
you know, what do you think about that? What do you think? And I said, I feel like it's stupid because we don't talk about how Cardi B educates herself on uh, presidential candidates and educates, you know, her followers and actually has presidential candidates on her Instagram to promote their platform, right? And um, uh, Megan, uh, yeah, Megan Thee Stallion, she did a whole campaign, you know, had signatures, did all her stuff for Breonna Taylor. And so it's like, why do black women have to be this? If you if you shake your butt, then you can only be somebody that shakes their butt. You know what I'm saying? If you're an activist, then you gotta look dressed like a nun, or we're not gonna we're not gonna respect you. And I just feel like that's not that that's not true. And I don't I don't think we should have to fit into those stereotypes. Cause I've even wondered that myself. I'm like, okay, if I wanna if I'm sitting up here trying to be an activist, then can I be in this bathing suit on my Instagram? And I oh, that's I, a word. That is a yeah, word. Like, yeah, I can. Yeah. I, I, that. I think and uh what I saw in the comment about um kind of this the glass ceiling working in sports, I often feel like I have to prove myself, but I learned to realize I'm at the table because I belong here. I have earned my seat and have to almost say, um, are you supposed to be here? Yeah. So also in I went to Howard University, um, and you know, H-U, Bison. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, going to an HBCU, um, I had some insecurities about going to, uh, you know, these white institutions, working at these white institutions and being a black woman in this space. And I quickly learned and I had to repeat to myself, one is that I had to stand in my legacy, right? Like my grandmothers fought for me to be here. My mom mm. fought for me to be here. My my ancestors, like they made the way for me. And also my education at Howard University and all HBCUs, shout out to all HBCUs, that created a um a you know a, a, a whole different perspective that a lot of white people don't have like I knew about I knew about black scholars I knew about black philosophers I knew about um W.B. Du Bois and like Franz Fanon and all these people they had never heard of them so then I recognized that like I'm at the table because I have a different perspective and and that perspective is valuable and also part of the way that I've even been able to build my business is the fact that they cannot reach the black community they don't know how to do it. Like, they're like, oh, we just, we just can't figure it out. We don't know why they won't do X, Y, Z thing. And I'm like, it's because you're not black, <laughs> first of all. And yep. so, like, you need me just as much as I need you, right? And, and so, you know, these big pharmaceutical companies, like, I don't get intimidated by them anymore because I know that they need me. And they can't, they can't do what I do. So I just, you know, that I think recognizing your worth in that way has, has helped a lot. Yeah, we don't need cosigns. We already it, you know? Yeah. Been it. They steal our culture. They steal our, our you know, like they're always looking to us to set the, set the uh, standard. So right. We should set it for ourselves. Right. And that's what I said. I was like, because, you know, they had the, the white woman. And I was like, first of all, why does she feel like she's qualified to speak on a black experience anyway? Mm -hmm. Who our daddies are, how we being set back, all this other stuff. Like, you don't know the first thing it is to be black. And so it was like, for you to sit up here and, and say anything and speak on anything about and, and I feel like it's a different thing for black people because we have to learn both. We have to cold switch, right? So it's like I can't. I feel like I can't speak on certain things, you know, within their their. I can't even call it culture because literally, if black people sat their asses down for <laughs> a week and do nothing, they wouldn't know what to do. You know. What I'm saying? So I'm like, how do you even? How are you even qualify? Why is this video even being shared? Yeah, I think. Um thinking of, speaking of schools, so unfortunately, when I went to Open House, I already knew I wanted to go to Winston, but when I went to Open House and got to talk to people within my department, um, a particular professor 
just came off super negative and he was negative throughout my entire time there but his first words were well nobody graduates from our department in four years everybody graduates in five years and of course he wasn't black um but for me when I heard that I was like oh no <laughs> I'll be graduating in four years just to prove you wrong just to shut you up and then thinking of when I went to my master's program and my the head of my committee was a white woman and then the other two people on my committee were women of color um they weren't black but they were still women of color and I felt seeing how the head of my committee versus one of my other professors who was the head of my friends committee how differently they approached us in our research um my committee head didn't provide me with any tips or any um advice when i was trying to do my thesis but we would speak and she wouldn't have anything for me to correct but as soon as the rest of my committee came together then it was oh yeah you should do this you should do that and i just felt like why aren't you telling me this from jump versus when my friend's committee head would speak to her she would provide her with all these things that she could work on and i think it was just a matter of like we're both women of color and we're already going to have to struggle to succeed in this field regardless so why am i going to stand in your way or why am i not going to provide you with the avenue for you to be your best um and it just baffles me because the head of my committee was a woman so you would think like oh you're a woman but she was white so you know i think one thing that's good about this conversation and even just kale last week and we were talking about this is most of the things we're talking about are the women of color who we felt like didn't give us the encouragement support we needed were older and so i think what our generation is doing is reversing that like i have direct reports that are black and i'm like hey i'm gonna treat you guys like i treat everyone else but then we have sidebars and i'm like you are black there are only i work in a company that's 3,000 people on the corporate side, there's less than 20 of us. So mm -hmm. I'm like, listen, we're gonna do this. I'm gonna tell you this and I'm doing this because I know the conversation that happens when we're not present or you know, things like that, extra time with them to make sure they really have what they need or they understand the task at hand. And so I think with our generation, we're like course correcting some of those actions and realizing that we can help each other, that you being successful doesn't hurt my success, um, which the generations before us, it it just wasn't like that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. About the generation before us, like they're they they're they're still like of course we're passing on drama, right? Like um, generational drama, Not, and I think they're scared. Like, I, I get told sometimes by older people, like, why do you wear your hair like that? You shouldn't wear your hair like that when I have my natural hair. And it's, I don't think that they're, like, hating. I just feel like they're scared because they know what it is to see a black person. And if their hair isn't straight, how they're going to be treated. And so, and then, uh, and they might not have experienced, but, you know, their mom or their, somebody. And so, like, instead of, like, we were talking about Brittany, instead of, like, well, why? Why are we doing it like this? They have just continued the cycle. But we're the generation is like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing it like this? Why, why does that make sense? Why, like, um, can somebody explain this to me, please? And so we are... Um, <laughs> Like the way that they talk to us, like our parents, how they used to talk to us and toughen us up, you know, because to prepare us for this white world, like really traumatized us. And so we're like, okay, we're not going to talk to our children like that. We're not going to do this to our, our, our kids and like you guys, the um, people that were mentoring because that didn't work. They, they meant well, but it just doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, that goes to... I'm gonna drop this term and I'm, I want y'all to look it up if you haven't heard of it, respectability politics. This idea that um, we are supposed to be respectable in society to combat stereotypes um, mm -hmm. and, and become successful in white, in white culture and white, um, white businesses and that kind of thing. But, and that goes back to your point, Jessica, about um, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. Why do they like, uh, they're being criticized because they're supposed to be respectable but black women in particular are the only group in the world that have that that have always been hypersexualized and then uh you know 
and expected to work and expected to take care of other people's children and then but then also like highly victimized and so it's like we we Too much. Can't win we can't win whether we cover ourselves up or we dress up like how you know like like we're on the street and so it doesn't work for us this respectability politics do not work what do, and we know that when you see a black a black boy out on this on the corner like it doesn't matter what he's wearing he's black right and so mm. it doesn't matter what he does it doesn't matter what he says he's black respect respectability politics does not protect you from racism and so at that point when we've learned that then you know this glass ceiling is like okay if i can't move up in your company because of whatever reason i'm just gonna start my own and i think that i've seen also like this rise in black female entrepreneurship because a lot of these companies also have not really taken the time to cater or build their businesses around catering to black communities and so there's so much opportunity for black people and, and black women in particular to start businesses and thrive in those spaces because white people just don't even bother. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, you know, at this point, I'm just like, I don't care about respectability politics. I'm going to start my own. Mm -mm. I agree. I agree. Um, does anybody else have anything to add? All right, so um, I have another gift. So um, Barnes and Noble book, uh, excuse me, book card, <laughs> Barnes and Noble gift card for one of my lucky participants. Um, so you can go buy the book as soon as I recommend it to you. All right, it's worth $15. I have everybody's names here. So I'll do Allison's first. Everybody's name is here. I'll do Allison's gift first, and we'll see who wins that. Sasha! Woo! Sasha, I get a 30 minute consultation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see who gets a gift card. Let's get some more. Let's get some more. All right. Leah, woo! It's a Barnes and Noble. Fantastic. Thanks, girl. So, a um, couple more things. Almost done. I wanted to read you guys this. Um, well, I don't know. It's not. It's it's pretty long, so it's not a paragraph. But like this part of the book that I felt like, uh, and honestly, it kind of ties into what we were literally just talking about. So, divine intervention, definitely. So. There is one rule. The rule is there are no rules. Happiness comes from living as you need to, as you want to, as your inner voice tells you to. Happiness comes from being who you actually are instead of who you think you're supposed to be. Being traditional is not traditional anymore. It's funny that we still think of it that way. Normalize your lives, people. You don't want a baby, don't have one. I don't want to get married, I won't. You want to live alone, enjoy it. You want to love someone, love someone. Don't apologize, don't explain, don't ever feel less than. When you feel the need to apologize or explain who you are, it means the voice in your head is telling you the wrong story. Wipe the slate clean and rewrite it. No fairy tales, be your own narrator, and go for a happy ending. One foot in, one foot in front of the other. You will make it. Um, and so if I really want everybody to, you can say it out loud or you can write it in the chat or like if it's really personal, you can keep it to yourself. But I want you to write down or say one thing you're going to say yes to for the rest of the year. I'll go. Um, I, 
I work a lot and I struggle with balance. And so one thing that has really been helpful for me is um, taking an hour lunch every day. Uh, normally I will work straight through lunch. I'll eat while I'm on me in meetings and then I'm just like exhausted at the end of the day. So I'm going to say yes to some self care and take an hour lunch every day. That's going to be hard, but I'm going to say yes to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Anybody else got one off the top of their head? Um, I think for me, let me back. Um, oh yeah, I think I think that's what I was saying to say saying yes to no. Like if it does not serve me, I know I hate the cliche terms because like they can they can start to I don't know people just use them for everybody. Like they, why they being toxic? I'm just serving myself. I'm just doing what best serves me. Like just you just did the whole toxic. <laughs> But like, yeah, just um, saying no to things that do not make me happy, that do not push um, me forward, that, like I said, uh, that about me wanting to please people and, you know, sacrificing myself, just saying no to all of that. All right. Putting myself first. Yes to being me. <laughs> yes to saying no, TT. We on the same wavelength. Um self-care yes self-care my work-life balance is terrible i'll be getting off of work at 11 o'clock at night i know um i want to take a picture but everybody is like my hair my hair so uh can y'all y'all want to take a picture hey stacy thanks I allow the small things to take over my peace. Yes. Oh, look at all the lovely ladies. Oh, y'all so pretty. <laughs> all right. I think I think some people are um okay. Let me get my I'm gonna do a screenshot on my computer. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Cause I'm like, if y'all y'all should know me, like, I mean y'all don't know me, but uh, my Zoom game has definitely elevated because I'm still going into work every day. See, Brittany said my my Zoom game was trash, right? And like now I'm popping like y'all in individual screens. I can chat. I couldn't find the chat when I first started using Zoom. So because I'm still going into work, so I'm like, I feel like I've been moving. Like y'all don't even know. Y'all ain't seen no mishaps or nothing. All right, so on three, guys, please let's get a big smile. I am. I want y'all to. I y'all y'all can't see all these lights in here. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Seatbelt on, girl. Seatbelt on. Y'all pop it. Jail seatbelt on. Okay. All right, y'all ready? All right, all right. On three. One, two. You take it out. Oh, Jazz. Oh wait, y'all come pop it up. Pop up. Pop up. All right. One. Two. Oh, I heard it. Thank you. Um, y'all, I really, 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 from the bottom of my heart, appreciate you guys for coming and doing this thing with me. Um, a year ago, I never would have done anything like this. You know. I've, I always felt like, well, what what do people think? What, what are they going to listen to me? What do they think I have to say? Like, ain't nobody. And so um, just to, like, you guys to trust me, you guys to come up here, like I said, the very first one. And so you don't know what to expect. And I hope um, it was amazing. Please, you know, if you take pictures for yourself and please post it and please let me know what you think. And you know if there if there's criticism, please don't post that. But like you can you can tell me, I, I can take constructive criticism. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I hope you guys took your pictures. Um, thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm I'm trying not to cry, so like <laughs> we might need to get off soon. Allison, do you have anything you want to say before we get off? Um, yeah. So follow me on Instagram. <laughs> I. 
I'm, I have no problems with shameless plugs. Um, I put in the chat, my Instagram is underscore Allison Matthews. Um, but I, part of the reason I say that is because I share a lot of information, a lot of business tips, a lot of health tips, health equity work um, kind of thing. So uh, hopefully that will be of use to you all. And I, I'm so proud of you, Jessica. Thank you for inviting me. I feel honored to be the first. And I love you as my line sister, as my, as my friend, as my mentee, as all of those things. I'm so proud of you. So congrats on the first one. Yes, thank you guys again. I love you all. And I'm really, 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 really like. All right, y'all get off. <laughs> <laughs> and if you know me, I'm literally always crying. So, but yeah, I really, really appreciate you guys. And I hope y'all stay tuned for the next one and everything else. More Black Business Car Parades coming up. So please, if you guys are in the Raleigh Durham area, please come out because that's also a very, very important. Love y'all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs>